uh, our next speaker um, will be Mariana Martin Rodriguez, the translator of the European Commission in Brussels, but it's a daytime job. Apart from that, they establish extensively on science fiction, interpretive fiction, speculative fiction. He's also a uh, published, well, editor of uh, several volumes of uh, interpretive and fantastic fiction in translation, and also the editor of uh, an online journal. So, uh, apart from that, he, uh, today is going to talk about the undead, that is the title of his philosophy of the return, collective human resurrection as an ambiguous chosen revolution in modern secular speculative fiction. Okay, uh, as my very colleague has uh, mentioned, he has his it's, it's gone, but he's going to come back. And when he, when he comes back, then we're going to be all resurrected. But now we're going to consider uh, if some people get the resurrected earlier, how and uh, which consequences would be. Then I begin. Uh, the word revolution, revolution derives from Latin revolutio, which is the noun corresponding to the verb revolvo. I don't know how to pronounce it properly, Latin. This means approximately to roll over or turn back. I like its usual political meaning, revolution is not etymologically a change of political regime, social mores, or public mentality. It is rather a turning back to a past, allegedly better situation. Eventually, revolution became above all the sudden and mostly violent replacement of any particular political regime with a better one, at least according to its supporters. There are, however, other revolutionary ways of turning back of revolution, revolution, at least in utopian fiction. If utopian fiction is all about thinking an alternative social and political world to the, our real one, as well as about expressing it mainly through literary means, it can be argued that revolution is a founding, the founding event of for utopian order. Both in utopias utopias and dystopias, this original revolution is usually of a political nature. Indeed, utopian fiction is often politically speculative fiction. Nevertheless, the utopian mode in literature can also serve other manners of social reflection. Moreover, a revolution can be imagined as a solid public change not related to political activity. Both possibilities have been exploited in literary fiction in a variety of ways. One of them has consisted in conceiving a truly radical revolution according to the technological origin of this world. For example, for example, some writers have imagined a revolution that would mean a complete turnaround of our existential conditions, condition as beings fated to be there rather sooner than most of us would like. Through this revolution, the disease would collectively return to life. Instead of turning lead people having a poor in the world from the first revolution onwards, have usually endeavored to do. What consequences would entail this return of the dead as resurrected human beings, both for their families and society at large, have been examined in a series of literary fictional works that we are to address in this general comparative and or to superficial overview. Our intent is not to consider these works as primarily artistic textual artifacts, but to explore them as cultural descriptions of alternative and as such utopian kinds of new societal situations following the speculative resurrection of a more or less wide group of deceased people in the modern period. These works offer various answers to some questions that could arise following such resurrection. For example, how could the living accommodate to the return of the formerly dead? What would be their demographic impact? How would the society of the living be transformed through the contact with them, especially if the return are still human? but also have some physical or behavioral features distinguishing them from the ones already living when the resurrection took place. How could they be included in or excluded from the pre-existing community? Ultimately, 
what would the meaning of life and death become after such an occurrence? This difference, surprising perspectives on ourselves as ephemeral beings living within a world endowed with limited resources, both material and emotional. Both approaches had already combined in a recent novel, Days of Moths, Their Return from the year 2013. Uh, it's been Converted into, it's been turned into a TV series, but the TV series it wasn't successful, as successful as a novel. Uh, the story told in the novel, which is set in a small town in the southern uh, United States, is all about healing the wounds inflicted to our souls by the final departure of our loved ones, and about the difficult acceptance of such departure. For unexplained reasons, long them people start appearing far from their homes as if time had not passed from their deaths, and remembering nothing of their having passed away. One of them is an 80 year old child who is brought back to his parents who are now very old. Although they know that he cannot be their true child, they treat him as if he were himself, as they do to other neighbors also returned. They consider the return as fellow humans whereas many other people reject them, even violently, as if they were impossible monsters. They also oppose the government's policy of detaining the return in concentration camps, one of which is set in their own town. At the end, all returns disappear as mysteriously as they have appeared, after having allowed some to really heal by letting pass freely memory and love to protection, while many others have kept their hearts locked. Unconsciously, the return had offered a utopia of love recover, thanks to the suspension of their otherness. They came to us as vulnerable individuals, not as a separated and powerful community. Nonetheless, they could not be readily admitted in the city of Delhi. Love would not suffice when material considerations enter the equation. Mott's novel combines, indeed, the philosophical issue of the status of the return with a social one entailed by the challenge of including back uh, in the community the ones that had departed from it forever. Formerly forever. For the American other governments dealing with a surge of all new citizens to cut afford, the main concern was not love of spirit, but how to prevent the collapse of social order and the depression of a population that was and was not alien. In the return, the answer is concentration camps. Other options and possibilities have also been explored in fiction. The myth reaction, reaction to collect the resurrection in modes to return <coughs> follows a long tradition of fictional reluctance to collect the resurrection as a social rather than emotional phenomenon. This reluctance runs <coughs> parallel to the one to be seen in the linked topic of immortality. There is a nice book about this in the journal. This reluctance runs per uh, sorry. Individually, one might wish immortality as much as one could desire the return of the deceased loved ones. But as a member of society, the prospect would probably not be such a positive one. Collective mortality would impose excessive pressure on our planet, while the return of the dead in great numbers would tear society apart for diverse reasons. These are already commonly sketched in one of play verse, premiered in Madrid in 1878. Is the title in English book read Improving World's Plan? And the story follows it, it, it is when well, it is known that a pharmacist has scientifically concocted a potion able to resurrect the dead and that he is going to prove its effect in the local cemetery, he is pressed to give up his plans first by a woman little interested in seeing again his late husband, then by a physician alarmed by the prospect of losing his patrons since nobody will be afraid of dying, and finally by relatives of the deceased uh, person concerned by the end of their property, since their return will claim their money now served by their heirs. By their heirs sorry. At the end, a crowd threatens the inventor until he recognizes with them that God takes away whom he likes, and there should be no, not be amending his work, as the title says, although religious reasons are rather secondary. The idea of preferring the dead in the graves is shared by further Hispanic writers, even without religious overtones. 
We might want to attribute such a negative view of any natural or supernatural novel resulting in secular resurrection to a certain mistrust of historical novelties, novelties and revolutions that have often resulted in conditions far worse than the previous ones. Or else, we could think of a widespread trend to see the potential neg negative consequences and abuses of any human progress, a stance that we consider either pessimistic or elusive. On the other hand, this pessimism is often balanced by humor. Although the issue can be examined in all seriousness, the comic tone helps readers to swallow the bitter pill of a rather black view of society and mankind, as these are confronted as a whole to issues of life and death. As a successful example of this, from a literary point of view, a short story by a Catholic Argentinian and Catholic Abolitia, entitled in English, Confided Families Fight for a Better World, collected in, in the volume Trafalgar has been translated, is the volume form 1979, and has been recently translated into English. Uh, in this narrative, the universal and continuous resurrection of this disease is shown as the main source of oppression for the living. The question of limited food and the work resources is not directly discussed there, since their return keep existing without bodily needs. Rather, it is the oppressive nature, nature of a past always physically present and preventing any new initiative what causes the unhappiness of those forced to cohabit with the resurrected ancestors, following a celestial recurrent phenomenon across gases turning the dead immediately into reanimated corpses, but who nevertheless keep the personalities intact and are able to normally talk and move. In the narrative of this story is the father an Argentinian anti-hero telling to invite friends with the typical style of club stories and familiar conversation, he travels to different far-fetched planets in order to pray. He arrives in this one only to see that everybody has the same surname, Confale, because all the inhabitants are aware of being related thanks to the living testimony of the return from very old times. The technology is forbidden and the people are afraid of posing their many parents intend to control the behavior behavior of their living descendants, spouses, etc., in order to prevent them from introducing any novelty contrary to all habits and from enjoying the central pleasures now precluded to them as the renovated people unable to enjoy any pleasures of the flesh. As a result, progress can hardly take place in any form, although there are persistent groups of bad children, bad children in Spanish, who secretly develop technology and try to keep in touch with the early life inhabitants of other planets. Trafalgar succeeds in helping the bad children by getting assistance from a technological advanced alien culture to block the common gases that have prevented the dead from following the common course of horses. Thus, life and civilization can then follow their course in Gonzalez's world. This happy end, which is consistent with the pleasant life comedic mode of the telling, doesn't prevent the story from holding punches. Not only are the resurrected a starkly conservative force in itself, they also had succeeded through their sheer number and the unit of intent in making true life miserable, as well as in rooting out open opposition. The living are mostly conditioned to resignation and conformity. Even their authorities are chosen depending on their docility to the death's rule, while the progressive bad children have to work in secret, in secret, and without real hope of overturning them until any technology comes to the rescue, thanks to Trafalgar. The Mortal couldn't find enough forces within their civilizations to withstand the conservatism underpinning conservatism and working by the resurrected, who are in a stronger position to save the society, society as if better suits them, having been around for longer and since earlier. A similar kind of reward is presented in a very short story by Luis Garcia Campinas, a Spanish professor at the University of Salamanca, in their title Overbooking, is from 2005, which complements Gordon D. Sherr's black humorous view with an examination of the speculative economic and labor impact of collective resurrection on contemporary societies, especially in a Europe continuously confronted with a lack of sufficient financial resources 
to satisfy ever-increasing social demands. A rather defectual young man, young man discovers a morning that a woman is using his bathroom. She tells him that the afterlife is now so full that many have been sent back to life to the former home. In order to avoid a property conflict, he goes out for a walk in the for a walk in the city. It seems more populated than earlier. The queues in front of public administration institutions, such as employment offices, are longer than usual, since the formerly dead also wish to get their social benefits back. Upon his return to his home, after having news of the possibility of sharing his apartment with an attractive return woman, he sees that her husband has, all, has also returned from the afterlife. The young man leaves his apartment for book, clueless about what he could do to avert the paper. The open-ended recruits ask from knowing if the other living are going to react in the same passive way. But the story raises nonetheless the issue of a large and sudden influx of aliens having to reintegrate into any given society when this is not ready to receive them unless the natives are excluded from their limited pool of resources housing, etc. Garcia Mambrina's narrative can be read as a metaphorical comment on the unintended consequences of the welfare state, as well as of the dire fate of those in it, such as the unemployed Jews, that are not in a position to challenge their elders who enjoy vested rights, and who certainly are the most interested in keeping any liberalization and change in a bay. The reversal of that would entail the suspension of social renewal, a revolution to prevent evolution, and to return to things past in order to keep them as they were, as static as they are in traditional minded utopias, both in books and in practice, and whenever the social stasis is promoted, either in an Arcadian past, in an egalitarian communist future, or in an, in an idealized welfare present. These Hispanic research and fiction are highly conservative in substance, although their authors appear to mistrust, to mistrust novelty for novelty's sake, that is often embraced in contrast by Anglo-American speculative fiction writers when dealing with the subject of collective resurrection. Probably the, he the hegemonic status of English-speaking countries in the world, namely the United States of America, has persuaded these countries writers that technical progress is not to be curtailed, especially if it is promoted by the huge corporations that work together with the government to advance their geopolitical interests through their so-called soft power or otherwise. Accordingly, a far-fetched idea such as collective resurrection is taken for granted as long as it is technically viable without any apparent resistance from the public administration or civil society until it is too late. First, anyway, and then think of the consequences is the idea underpinning most of the works in English on this subject. If this reflects or not real life situations and ideologies, this is probably not the right place to discuss it, although the, the difference from the Hispanic approach, as we have suggested, seems clear. In the above mentioned Spanish early research on play, a socially risky technology is finally abandoned following a consideration of its potential effects. In contrast, Robert Silverberg, a very famous science fiction writer, had always the possibility of technologically being recalled to life. This is the title of the novel, it's the from the year 158, and he had enthusiastically endorsed it. The novel's hero is James Harper, a former American presidential candidate and prominent lawyer who agrees to publicly defend a new technology for resurrecting surely dead people through a complicated process, entailing the risk of reanimating just the body but leaving lying blank its mind. When the news of the discovery is leaked, he has to fight for it through preventively legalizing it against public outcry by religious and conservative groups changing public opinion and ethical doubts about the procedure. He overcomes all of them by sheer will. He even accepts to die and to be resurrected in order to prove that it is viable technology after the zombie risk is effectively addressed. He finally overcomes all opposition. He can now look forward to the new task ahead.
ahead in a world where that has been defeated. He knows that are quotation marks. The harder part is that to come. But he believes that quotation, it's all going to turn out for the best. In the core tradition of American imperial and golden age inspection optimism, proper to the land of promise and dreams fulfilled at least in theory. Silver Bird himself would later show how it turned, it turned out for the best in the, in the novelette Born with the Dead. And I'm going to tell you, its approach is rather existential and emotional, <coughs> but anyway, it, would, would, it would shows that Silver Bird wasn't embracing uh, technology for technology's sake. Um, Born with the Dead was published in the 70s, and this time um, it wasn't any more time to just celebrate technology. From new web science fiction and especially cyberpunk onwards, the old optimism was partly replaced by the awareness of the dangers of any uncontrolled technology within the capitalist system. The warnings, however, usually end up becoming the endorsement of what we are being warned against through the perhaps illusory perception that savior, savior heroes can arise from within the very system being criticized in order to set things right. A happy end is thus secured, when the relevant technology, risky or not, is finally endorsed as well. This can be clearly perceived in a couple of novels on a new class revive brought about by the same kind of technology promoted in Silverback's Recall to Life, albeit with changes requested by the contemporary development of information technology. Both in Kevin J. Anderson's Resurrection Incorporated from the year 88, and I am McDonald's Starkly Cyberpunk Necroville from the year 94. All kinds of electronic devices incorporated into the resurrected allow for their enhancement or their debasement according to the policies paid or not for the voluntary or forced resurrection. A minority of wealthy people, corporate tycoons in Anderson's novel, computer geniuses, and other kinds of postmodernist stars in McDonald's, enjoy the system to the full, up to wanting to die and be resurrected out of a movie in neighborhood. They have to no scruples about using the cheap labor composed of formerly dead, whose own memories and will are limited to the minimum necessary to keep them properly performing their appointed tasks from manual to sexual, while living workers become redundant and social discontent must be repressed by force in Resurrection Incorporated or other more devious means in Negroman. Fortunately, a hero among the wealthy and powerful experiences a process that makes him, it is of course male in both novels, reconsider his position in society as well as the fairness of it all especially at the blue rate of being the class due to conspiracies within their privileged classes. In the fight for survival, both people discovered that there is an underground movement of resurrected servants who have been able to overcome their electronic implants in Anderson's story or that they have built up a civilization of the planet from which they can defend their freedom on Earth in McDonald's novel. In one way or another, the heroes are in the center of a counter conspiracy, counter plot, in favor of a fairer balance of power between both kinds of human kinds. In worlds where information technologies are so extensively used that the traditional definition of human as a natural animal doesn't longer apply. And the boundaries between life and death, between mechanical and organic, are blurred. In this context, resurrection is just part of a whole technological package that these two brightest never will in position. Confronted to the dystopian worlds resulting from the unsaid exploitation of technological progress by the American type of full free market capitalism, they depict the uneasy consistence between the living and the resurrected in believably dark tones, but they avoid any fundamental criticism as they show how the system can help itself not through collective action, but mostly through individual agency. The system is rotten, but this operation is restored after some improvements by the providential hero. We just can't realize the good guy can but prevail, and this topia will be soon corrected but not reversed. No need to give up collective resurrection because someone will eventually save the day, 
especially now the need to consider if the whole thing had been properly conceived in the first place. If something won't happen with American like capitalism and the technology going along with it, we don't need to worry. They will ultimately bring us utopia and life everlasting, whatever the cost. This conservatory prospect is usually commercial feelings coming from that cultural area, as well as those with the globally to compete with them in the book market. Anderson and McDonald's novels are written according to this formula, although McDonald's tries harder to conceal it under postmodernist, or rather plain modernist, rhetorical and structural devices, adding to the overall confusion in the plot without much improving his writing, following the fashion of cyberpunk. In contrast, in contrast Resurrection Incorporated is honestly written in the conventional novelistic mode usual in science fiction with that particular literary pretension as one more fish in a very densely populated pond. Consider the limited literary and intellectual ambition, it is perhaps out of place to ask writers of commercial fiction for a serious reflection on the effects of a speculative collective resurrection in a given society. There are certainly some hints in the right directions, but the formulaic novels in English on resurrection from a social perspective and the two short alike pieces in Spanish in the same field don't go much farther beyond that. Jason Mott could have addressed this issue more deeply in The Return, The Novel of the Return, but his main objective was probably to explore the existential dimension of such an occurrence, following others that have done the same also in a literary act manner from Giacomo Leopardi onwards. Maybe loss is too intimate a reality for us to adopt a strange perspective and to consider mainly the social dimension of death overturn as a potential source of a new order that could be objectively presented and reflected on. The sublime, uh, the sublime emotion arising from the cosmic perspective of an eternity of life, or alternatively, the liberating laughter of cannibalist humor arising from the image of corpses as puppets adopting the mask of life have usually taken the center stage. The truest revolution of all still waits for this utopia, at least in the real of fiction. The only one where it is possible in this world so far, expecting that the Americans uh, can download us to computers and then we can live like everlasting. Thank you.